Hey everyone, and welcome back. It is time to be on the lookout for some scumbaggery, as we so often are on this channel. Paying money to get a game publisher to worsen the experience of their own game for their own customers is uh, is bad, and it's actually happening. Activision have degraded the experience of their customers in return for a big stack of money. But this year, they've done it differently. They've done it a bit worse. It's actually in a way that players really will feel. This year's bundle of uh, PlayStation advantages, as they are so called, are quite a step up from last year. And last year has actually managed to even lock off a game mode. Now this is something that appears to be getting a bit more aggressive that ties into the strategies of the various companies. And if you take a look at, say, some of Imran Khan's earlier tweets this year and some of the rumors going around the industry, until Microsoft came in swinging with their Bethesda acquisition, the people who are the most aggro on these things, on exclusives and perks and advantages, etc., etc., were Sony. Apparently, Microsoft was not willing to actually match Sony's offers for some of the things like what we're going to talk about in today's video. So it is important stuff. It does impact you. Even if you don't want to get a PlayStation, it impacts you. So that's what we're doing today. Of course, we're trying to get to 250k subs. So hit that sub button if you're not subbed already. We have a lot of content coming for you uh, this week from the team. So with that said, let's go. Call of Duty is unfortunately synonymous with platform-specific content deals. It has been for a long time, but this one is really getting people. So Call of Duty, Black Ops, Cold War players on the PlayStation will get a series of rewards, and that is in addition to the already PlayStation-exclusive Zombie Onslaught mode. Now, they get the Battle Pass Bundle bonus, uh, which is basically more tier skips to unlock stuff faster. They get the PlayStation Party bonus, wherein Partying Up grants you 25% bonus weapon XP, and that also works when playing cross-platform. But yeah, 25% bonus weapon XP. If you're a COD player, you're going to want that. There's also monthly PlayStation exclusive double XP events. And also, and this is so petty, PlayStation players get two additional loadout slots. You know, in a free-to-play MMORPG, you might only have a few character slots and you'll have to pony up more money to get, you know, more character slots in your, in your free-to-play MMO. But that now this sort of thing is happening in the buy-to-play premium Call of Duty, well, that is very strange. Now, this is all exclusive to PlayStation for one year. Obviously, Call of Duty is yearly, so by the time this stuff is on Xbox, it won't matter. And, of course, what's different here is that it far more touches core multiplayer gameplay. Stuff that people care about on day one. Whenever they hit level four in the new Call of Duty, they will have more loadout slots if they're on PlayStation. They will have more experience. They will get through the battle passes faster. PlayStation players will rank up faster than those players on other platforms. And that really does make that whole race to prestige, which is done in Call of Duty, well, not really ideal, a bit compromised. And of course, Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War shares progression across Warzone and Call of Duty Modern Warfare. So PS players all get that head start on Warzone for the next year. And those are some serious bonuses for PlayStation players. And that means that everybody else loses by default. Is this one-off? Is this a pattern? Well, let's talk about it. Specific to Call of Duty, last year's Spec Ops survival mode being exclusive was a change in pace. Previously, it used to be the PlayStation people got DLC um, earlier, right? So it is a little bit different. Um, so now, yes, the PS deal is bonuses and locked off modes. Now, on the topic of bonuses, we'll have a little bit more to cover decently shortly. So, yeah. 
platform exclusive COD content is getting more and more extreme and it's been getting more extreme since Sony took control of the deal in 2015. Now before that it was the Xbox players who would get DLC first and things like that and that started in 2010 with the resurgence pack of Modern Warfare 2. Now that's a deal that Xbox nabbed because of the strength of their platform at the time, you know Xbox Live was doing great, but with Microsoft dropping the ball on the Xbox One, of course it ended up that Activision were taken over by Sony with this deal. But the thing is here, you lose, and it's not just in Call of Duty. These things are PlayStation advantages, that is how Sony themselves brand it, so let's talk about the bigger issue. So as I said, these are not neat little bonuses, these are things that Sony called PlayStation advantages and that are actually a part of their overall business strategy. And they're right, they are PlayStation advantages, they are advantages that nobody else has. This is a concerted attempt to hinder the competition, to make Call of Duty players not think about the specs or the game availability of each console, but instead to think about how they have to get around corporate deal making. Now, that is a bit rough with Activision's desire for cross-play, but they do love money, and Sony are known to have been going very hard on deals like this in the past. In fact, the rumor mill was that they were outbidding Microsoft when it came to things like this. Of course, who got the last laugh in that one? Now, this is something that's, of course, very different to, say, the Soul Calibur games that did have all of their own platform-specific characters uh, since 2003, but there, every console got something unique, even though, to be honest, I still think that was a bit silly. But here it's simple. Sony want the COD players to know that uh, if they want to go and they want to race to prestige and do all of that, then the best place objectively to do it is on their console. If you want to level up your guns fast, do your challenges, blah, 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 you're going to be doing it in Sony. That's what they want. They want you to engage in the battle pass. They want you to use those extra tier skips. And that's why we're essentially seeing Sony pay for boosted progression on their platform. And are they only doing it with Call of Duty? Well, it is a bigger issue. And now we have to get into it. One of the most notable PlayStation advantages was Marvel's Avengers. That's one where Spider-Man was locked to PlayStation. And responding to criticism, Crystal Dynamics just said that Xbox and PC players had the option to play in PlayStation. Yes, uh, that's what we call bullshit, and that certainly makes me feel a lot less charitable to you, Crystal Dynamics. Not that anybody cares because your compromised piece of corporate gruel has been performing terribly and notably has lost a lot of money, so maybe it serves a whole lot of you's right for developing that game in that manner and not doing any of it justice. Now, a more interesting example is Grand Theft Auto V. You see, GTA Online will be free on PS5 for the first three months, and GTA V players on PS4 will get $1 million in Grand Theft Auto cash every month until the next-gen version releases in the second half of 2021. So yes, Sony here have literally paid Rockstar to throw Grand Theft Auto money at players to boost their platform. And another example of this being done is in fact on Warframe, where yes, Warframe is making it onto the next gen, but there is a PlayStation Advantage with the PlayStation version, which uh, basically it's uh, it's like a, a freebie that's got a skin that is based on the design of the DualSense controller, and I believe there's a boost and some currency. Now, going back further, if you want an extreme example, remember Destiny? Because that was scum. Sony paid to lock off a mission competitive map of the multiplayer, armor, guns, and ships, uh, and that also happened with Taken King and Rise of Iron. They had exclusivity on their launch. And you've got to, uh, you've got to remember here, yeah, losing a strike in Destiny really sucks, because Destiny doesn't have that many strikes, and it's a very repetitious game. Yes, Destiny got some hefty PlayStation exclusive content perks. Taken King had its PS exclusive content at launch, and that's something that stung given the total amount of content that was there and its price tag. And Destiny 2 actually worked in very much the same way, up until Bungie split from Activision. So this is stuff that Sony wants to do, and it is interesting that Sony decided to do that for a Bungie game, right? Bungie, of course, that's Halo fans coming from Xbox. It seems to me quite targeted that Sony put so much money into that Destiny situation because they knew that those Bungie fans were not their audience. 
So that's some of what's going on. We've got PlayStation advantages covering multiple major games that are coming out. There is, of course, things like Deathloop and Ghostwire that, uh, from what I understand, are pretty much just, here's some money, now it's a timed exclusive for us, please, types of deals. Obviously, Microsoft got the last laugh by then purchasing ZeniMax Media, uh, but, and of course, Microsoft are going to honor those deals, but you get the point here. Sony are really trying to make this a core part of their business model. So, are Sony the worst? Are Sony really the worst in the industry when it comes to deals like this? Probably, maybe. I mean, sure, Activision accept these deals and uh, they have accepted deals such as this from Microsoft themselves during the 360 era. But broadly speaking, Sony are doing this more than the others. And more recently, this has all fallen under the banner of PlayStation advantages, and it is something that they have been pushing more and more in the lead up to the next gen. And it sure is interesting to me that you've got even those deals like Deathloop and Ghostwire, you know, examples of just a third party timed exclusive being purchased. So is Microsoft any better here? It's kind of hard to tell. So if they ran things like they did during the 360 era where deals like this did exist, then yeah, they probably would be just as bad. But now they seem to have a different business model, right? They are competing through value, not through paying to sabotage the experience of customers on other devices. And I think that's an interesting thing. PlayStation are really trying to go premium. They're really trying to be slick. They're like, hey, we have the big budget blockbusters and our big budget blockbusters aren't just a popcorn movie that, no, 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 ours are Christopher Nolan blockbusters. They're art, you know, like God of War, like The Last of Us. They are building an ultra premium brand. That is so much of what you pretty obviously see Sony do with a lot of their first party developments as well. And this is actually an interesting thing because there were rumors that Sony were trying to push the price of games beyond $70, which I do think, uh, would sort of make sense for generally how they're trying to do their business. So I think they're trying to make the PlayStation experience feel like you're the guy with the, you know, that ultra premium credit card that gets you, you know, a little perk here, Uber credits there, uh, an airport lounge over there, right? And I think that's why doing these PlayStation advantages and these like sort of little tiny perks here and there is so much of what they're trying to do. Because the thing is, from what we understand, Microsoft absolutely could outspend them absolutely all the time. Microsoft have more money. Microsoft now have more studios. And also, Microsoft are Microsoft. They're a massive, diversified, profitable company. They have a market capitalization that is over 10x of Sony. And if you look at those on Google, remember the Sony one is in Japanese yen, so you do have to do the currency conversion. Microsoft just generally are a far bigger company. Now, from what we understand earlier on in this generation, Microsoft were not willing to actually meet the deals that Sony were slinging out there to these various companies for things like what we've talked about in today's video. Now, that's really interesting. When you know that Microsoft were not willing to reach those deals, and Sony were, even though Microsoft could absolutely afford them more than Sony, then it does tell you that Sony, are, they just know that this is the way they have to do things to make the PlayStation brand be, you know, super relevant, right? They need their exclusives, they need their perks, their advantages. I think what then happened is Microsoft perhaps realized that they can talk about value for a long time, but they're going to need something unique that people will be emotionally interested in. And I think that's why the Bethesda thing happened. Of course, with that Bethesda deal, we pretty much know that that was a big surprise to a lot of even Microsoft's own studios and staff. And we also believe that it was pretty damn late in the day in terms of the deal making. I mean, that deal was made after Sony already had secured exclusive stuff from Bethesda. So it's an interesting situation. I think that Sony know they have to make these very targeted deals. And I think they know that it's worth a pretty heavy sunk cost to them. They have to hit things like your favorite Avenger that you like from one of their games and your Call of Duty progression and getting a whole bunch of free currency in the free to play game or well, you know, GTA um, online that you happen to be playing. So how do we close this one off? Well, I think it's pretty simple. Exclusive stuff has always been a thing. And generally, if somebody funds a game, I am happy for it to be an exclusive. If Microsoft plays for a game, yeah, 
Release it only in your own console, sure thing. If Epic, from beginning, funds an indie studio to make a game, sure, make it an Epic Game Store exclusive, whatever, Epic would have funded the whole thing. I would say the same about Steam if they funded games. But with this stuff, this is exclusivity being emotionally targeted at players, right? It's targeted at the little Skinner boxes that operate in their head with the Call of Duty thing, right? The XP, the tier skips, you know? It's not just what games you get or what parts of the game you get. Now it's the core progression in what, the largest yearly multi-platform shooter, one of the larger franchises that's going on, it's that. It's free microtransaction currency in another one of the world's most popular online games, you know? Companies will go with the money. They'll go wherever it is. And Microsoft have more money to burn than Sony. And that does make you wonder, why does Microsoft not do similar? Why are there not Xbox advantages? Do they not feel the need? Do they not want to look bad? Is it not a part of their strategy? I think it's kind of hard to tell. My personal suspicion is that Microsoft actually is playing strategy while Sony is playing tactics. And what I mean there is, I think Microsoft is extremely willing to make massive investments that they will not see that much of a return on in quite a long time. It's going to take them some time to make back their seven and a half billion from Bethesda. But I think they know that the Xbox after this one will benefit massively from that repertoire of studios and that their business will as well, even just in terms of software sales. But if you move that over to Sony, I don't see them doing as much. They haven't done as many acquisitions as Microsoft has recently. Not really. They are targeting more of these short-term small things for shortly upcoming games. Uh, than Microsoft are. And those things do work a trick for Sony, absolutely. But I have to wonder if the situation really is that Microsoft are playing this very long game and are very okay to lose money short in the short term, and if Sony are far more playing than now, right? I mean, their exclusive lineup is way stronger. They have more of those advantages and perks and things that they've been doing. The only thing I'd say for Sony, though, is... You know, they're going to need more than Naughty Dog and Santa Monica Studio. Uh, I mean, Sucker, Sucker Punch will be doing great stuff with Tsushima, of course, but it's going to get to the stage where I feel like they're going to need to catch up because Microsoft is going to have them beat in value, going to have them beat on streaming and some of those extra value add features. I do wonder what Sony's going to be able to do, considering that while Sony's PlayStation division may be mostly toe-to-toe -to -toe with Microsoft's Xbox division, at the end of the day, if Microsoft Corp decides that it needs to do something big for its Xbox division, it can do more for that division than Sony Corp can do for its PlayStation division. And I think that's a very interesting thing for us all to pay attention to. And I know that this has absolutely sounded like a very, very Xbox fanboy sort of video. I'll say this. My planned gaming setup is a PS5 and a PC because at the end of the day, that's the best experience for me. So there you go. This is stuff to be thinking about, right? And how this is going to track forward into the future. So do let me know, what do you think? Who do you think is playing the long-term game here? If you were a betting person, who would you actually bet on to win in 10 years? Not just five, not just one year, but in 10. Who's got that big long-term thinking nailed? Let me know. Thank you for watching. And with that said, be sure to hit that sub button if you have not already, and I will see you next time.